All right, Tyler, I see what you're wearing. I, I take it you've been watching Better Call Saul season one? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. This it's is influenced uh, by Chuck, I'm assuming. You're worried about electromagnetic fields penetrating your body and you having some kind of reaction. I mean, I, I had never really thought about it before, but once I started thinking about it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I have that all the time. Anytime that I leave the house, anytime that there's any kind of battery or anything that emits, you know, an electromagnetic field, then uh, it just it bothers me, it makes me sick. And, and you know that it seems very likely that it's psychosomatic. Uh, I, I, I'm not crazy if that's what you mean. Okay. And I guess you just figured what, cause we're doing a podcast so you need to protect yourself. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, we've got the computer here and the mic and, and all that. It's a, uh, yeah, too much. All, all right. Well, I guess you can wear it, but just don't move around. Cause this thing's really tough with audio. Oh, well, I guess that's a good point. Yeah. I'll try I, to I, stay pretty still. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know how they film it on the show because it is hard to work with audio-wise. Yep, it really is. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Ignore the Bell. My name is Nathan. And I'm Tyler. Um, and we are talking Better Call Saul Season 1. So um, I've already been, I, I've done a Season 1 discussion of Breaking Bad with my friend Steve. Well, mm -hmm. our friend Steve. Um, yeah. But Steve and I have had a conversation because you have not watched Breaking Bad. That is correct. Um, Steve has not watched Better Call Saul. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have watched both. Um, and neither of you guys have watched El Camino. And so I'm just kind of out there on my own with El Camino. But with <laughs> Better Call Saul, um, we, we can have a conversation. And then Steve yep. and I are going to carry on our conversations with Breaking Bad. And we'll do season by season going through this. And so we're essentially going to be doing the same thing separately with Better Call Saul. And I feel like even though it seems strange to have a conversation about Better Call Saul with one person who has not watched Breaking Bad, I have to believe that you're not the only person on the planet who watches Better Call Saul but has not watched Breaking Bad. Yeah, I feel like there's probably five of us or something. <laughs> yeah, I think so. It's a very small number. <laughs> yep. But um, anyway, you can kind of speak to that group of people and then I can speak to the group of people who kind of know where a lot of this is going because of watching Breaking Bad and I mean some of it we know some of it we don't know and um that it so I, I I'm saying in other words you know if wh whatever your background is you're going to be fine with this whether yeah. you've watched Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad or just um Better Call Saul then you'll be fine with it but I I, I do think I don't know from re-watching season one of Better Call Saul, uh, the idea of having two brothers work together on a project <laughs> <laughs> seems like a bad idea. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I mean, I'm not even sure who I, who I identify with more. If it's the older, brilliant brother, thank you, or the younger, kind of a jerk brother, thank you. <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll take both <laughs> right <laughs> um yeah <laughs> but yeah no, I, in so I, far I as the show is like, go ahead I, I i can definitely uh more relate to jimmy than to chuck <laughs> right yeah well chuck's kind of a he aside like beyond the electromagnetic psychosomatic thing that he's got going on he's an interesting character oh yeah um, yeah you know, and I don't know how many people can exactly relate to him right. um, in comparison to Jimmy, where Jimmy has been an underdog essentially his whole life. Mm -hmm. So I, I think a lot of people view themselves more as underdogs than as somebody who just has everything going for them all the time and is awesome at everything, as Chuck seems to be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, anyway, we do have a sponsor for the podcast and then we'll get into it. So our sponsor for this week is Space Blankets, um, conveniently enough. So listen, I, I know that we're all worried about living in a surveillance state. You know, there's there's fears about the government invading your privacy. And while you might think that the solution is to just go completely off the grid and wear a tinfoil cap, the problem with a tinfoil cap is the government's still going to be able to spy on other parts of your body. Right. You don't want them to know what your thoughts are, which is why you're wearing a tinfoil cap, 
but what about what you had for dinner? You don't want them to know that kind of thing. You don't want them to know about your heart rate or your blood pressure or any of those things because you know what's going to happen. A government takeover, they're going to know exactly who to give treatment to and who not to. Um, you know, so for that reason, you want to turn to the experts at protecting your privacy, the experts with space blankets. So space blankets keep everything about you a secret from all of those people who are watching. And let's be honest, we all know they're watching. Absolutely. I am so thankful to have a, a space blanket of my own here. <laughs> I know you're completely sold out for this company. And yeah, <laughs> that's that's fine. Um, yeah. And it's a good look, too. It's very fashionable. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're you welcome. should see the looks I get when I walk down the street like this. It's, uh, yeah. I'll, it's I'll something. <laughs> it's, it's definitely one way to attract the ladies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll catch their attention. I, I don't know if it's good attention, but you'll, you'll get their attention with this. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, folks. I hope you enjoy. No, oh, man. I wish this discussion could go on forever. Ignore the bell! We're gonna keep going, people! Alright, so we were talking uh, Better Call Saul, Season 1. So, I, I want to get a little bit of background from both of us, like, provide a little bit of background um, for how we came to the show, and then I want to give a little bit of an overview in terms of the plot and the characters, because it's a fairly complex show. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I've tried to map it out as best I can, just in case people who are watching or listening to this have not watched season one in a while to be reminded of some of these things, because there's a lot going on and you've yeah. got the, the, I guess for I, I lack of perfect attribution that I will attribute this to a Vince Gilligan de device of having time jumps because mm. he's got a lot of time jumps in breaking bad. And then it's just carried over basically in the exact same style into better call Saul. And so because of that, it jumps around and then you have completely separate stories that are going on simultaneously right. that are disconnected for a long time, mm -hmm. right? Ultimately, they start threading together, but they stay fairly disconnected for quite a while, um, even more so in Better Call Saul than you get in Breaking Bad. And so because of that, then I feel like it... it more so than what we've done with other podcasts. And I feel like there is a little bit of a need to remind people of um, some of the plot elements. Right. So, I mean, I guess I already went over my background with Breaking Bad on the podcast where I talked about season one with Steve. Um, so from there, when I found out that, you know, Saul Goodman was getting a spinoff and that it was specifically going to be a prequel series, mm -hmm. I was interested but i have to admit and i don't know if other people felt this way or not uh but i think even bob odenkirk listening to him uh, has said this who plays jimmy mcgill or, or saul goodman because i watched an interview he wasn't really sure that it was a good idea when <laughs> vince gilligan first suggested it, he's like um i don't know it was his response of do you think that this guy could have his own show because he's like because he asked him that in like season two or season three of Breaking Bad. Um, and, you know, he came late to Breaking Bad. He wasn't in the, the first season. And um, anyway, so asking the actual actor, well, what do you think? And he wasn't so sure. And when I heard, I'm just like, oh, oh, no. Like, I'll watch it, but I don't know how many other people will watch it. And I don't know that it's going to ever reach the level of Breaking Bad or even come close and it's probably going to get cancelled after not too long right. and I completely underestimated how good of a writing staff they have that I don't know how many of them have carried over from Breaking Bad but with Vince Gilligan as being the showrunner and then uh, presumably I don't know I, I should have looked this up before we started the podcast but presumably bringing over some other writers but just the strength of the writing on the show that and it's doing a very different thing from Breaking Bad so when I started watching it I went oh wow okay like this is so much more um, complex and deep than I thought that it was and the tone is different than I thought that it would be because he's kind of a buffoonish character for much of Breaking Bad Ooh. until you realize how much of it is like Saul Goodman and not Jimmy McGill. Okay. Do, do you know what I mean by that? I, I know that you haven't yeah. watched Breaking Bad, but I'm saying that Saul Goodman is a persona that he takes on 
that that's right. his con man persona, but that's not really who he is deep down. Mm -hmm. And so if you only see the con man for the longest time and you only get little glimpses of the real person behind it, of James McGill, then you don't even know what that show would be. Right. Yeah. And so to start way before he is acting as Saul Goodman attorney, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting because it's, it's surprising in other words. Um, so when I first started watching it, I was worried. I wanted it to be good, but I didn't know what was there. Right. It's sort of like, you know what I mean? You just don't know what kind of soil you have. Right. And, um, yeah. So you're not sure how well whatever this is is going to grow. And then starting to to watch it with season one and rewatching season one, I'm like, wow, they I mean, Vince Gilligan knew what he was doing. I don't know why I was yeah. concerned because <laughs> I have <laughs> an incredible amount of respect for Vince Gilligan. Um, mm. I, it just it kind of, you know, there's some people who just can't let it go. And right. <laughs> sometimes it's just like you just don't have a different idea for another original concept and that you're going to do a spinoff. Like when is a spinoff ever as successful or even close to as successful as the original? I mean, the only one I can really think of off the top of my head would be Frasier. Yeah. I was going to say that too. <laughs> and that it's yeah. a different show. And in mm -hmm. fact, I prefer Frasier to cheers. Agreed. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think a, a lot of people do, but aside from that, all of the failed attempts at doing spinoffs, uh, yeah. there's so many. So that was kind of my fear. But that's basically how I came to the show, because why would I not watch it if I loved Breaking Bad as much as I, I loved it when I first watched it and the second time and third time and all of that? Why would I not continue <laughs> on in that story universe? Right. So what about yeah. you, though? That's where I'm really like, I know you've told me this before, but it's been a while since we talked about this. It's been a couple of years. Um, when I found out that you were watching Better Call Saul, but you had not watched Breaking Bad, <laughs> it made no sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the uh, the story behind that, I guess, is, um, uh, I mean, every, I had heard, you know, everybody talk about how great uh, Breaking Bad was, um, and uh, I wasn't really interested in the show, because I was like, oh, it's like about, it's about drugs and drug dealers and all that. I'm like, ah, that doesn't sound like something that I would really be that interested in. So even if it's really good, then it wasn't, you know... It wasn't at the top of my list of like, oh, I need to make sure to watch that. Right. Um, and then when I heard about this, uh, you know, this show Better Call Saul, that was going to be a spinoff. Um, and I saw like all the commercials for it because at the time that I was watching, um, uh, you know, I was watching uh, The Walking Dead on AMC. And so they would, you know, cross promote with um, right. all these different commercials for Better Call Saul. And, you know, it was all about like, oh, yeah, it's this lawyer who's, you know, like down in his luck and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, I really like, you know, the the lawyer stuff and all that, um, like all those kinds of stories. So I was like, well, OK, that might be interesting. And if it's, you know, going to be as good as Breaking Bad or, you know, in, by the same people who made the amazing, mm -hmm. uh, critically acclaimed Breaking Bad, then that sounds like something that would be really enjoyable to me. Um, and then it was also partly uh, because the premiere of Better Call Saul came on and um, uh, our sister and uh, brother-in-law, Amanda and David, then they were over um, at, a, at the house and they wanted to watch it because they watched Breaking Bad. Uh, and they loved I'm Breaking surprised. Bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did not know that they watched the show at all. That is surprising to me. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they really loved uh, Breaking Bad. And so then they really wanted to watch uh, Better Call Saul. And so because I was there, then I was like, well, it didn't sound like an interesting show. So I'll watch it. And then I was like, I think that this might actually be a good experiment to see how well right. Better Call Saul can work having not seen Breaking Bad. Yes. Because if it's all, you know, oh, you need to have seen Breaking Bad, right, then right. it's not a good show. Like, it's not really, I, I agree. you know, <laughs> that it doesn't work. But, oh my goodness, this show is so incredible that it has uh, made me more excited to watch Breaking Bad. Mm. But at the same time, I'm, I'm now, like, 
I've committed myself to this experiment of I want to watch all of Breaking Bad, having not seen any uh, or sorry, I want to see all of uh, Better Call Saul without having seen any of uh, Breaking Bad. And then I'll probably get to watching Breaking Bad. <laughs> right. And I think that like I actually I, don't, I wouldn't say that I admire but I am certainly interested in the experiment. I am highly right. fascinated by how this works. And I feel like as far as a, a um, I don't know, a target audience to, to, or not even a target audience, but a test audience, like a test screening, mm -hmm. I feel like there's so much value in this to yeah, have absolutely. somebody who's watching Better Call Saul who has not watched Breaking Bad. And then e even just in the conversation that we're gonna have, between this and the next few seasons of the show to, to see how we react differently. And I will say that there may be times where I just feel compelled to bring up stuff that is happening, that has happened in Breaking Bad. And when that's the case, I'm just gonna ask you to either take off your headphones or just <laughs> turn the volume all the way off and then I'll, I'll, I'll continue on and I will give you the thumbs up when I'm done. And so for people <laughs> who are uh, watching, then you can just pay attention to the thumbs up if you're if you're like Tyler and you've only watched Better Call Saul and you don't want to have anything spoiled in Breaking Bad, then just wait until I give the thumbs up and then you can turn the volume back on. And people who are listening to the audio, audio only, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I right. have no good solution <laughs> other than, I guess, skip forward a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so, okay, that's really interesting. Now, bef like, before we get into specifics with it, I want to go over what's happening from a plot standpoint. And once I started mapping this out, and I did this, it just took me a few minutes before we started podcasting, but there's a lot going on in this show. Uh, and so I wanna give an overview and then maybe we'll go storyline by storyline. Yeah, uh, actually, before we get into that, uh, I did want to quickly mention my little bit of background on Breaking Bad, because sure. I have not seen a single episode of it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but I do know the general plot um, of, you know, a uh, science teacher who uh, is diagnosed with cancer and then, uh, you know, starts to uh, create uh, meth. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, in order to uh, pay for all his, you know, medical expenses. Um, is that is that about right? <laughs> That's episode one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's not really like, like, right. basically nothing gets spoiled from knowing that. You you know the pilot. You know the premise of the show. Right. And um, he becomes this whole, you know, drug uh, uh, kingpin almost. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I also do know how the show ends. <laughs> oh, you do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how do you know but, that? Uh uh, I was watching the Colbert Report, um, and um, Steve Colbert ruins everything. <laughs> well, he had been Gilligan. He, he had been Gilligan on the show, and um, oh, yeah, it was the day after the Breaking Bad uh, finale, right? And they just talked about the end of the show for the entire gotcha. interview. Well, so. I mean, I think that honestly, though, and, and this is where this is why I have issues when people complain about spoilers, um, because really you don't watch something for the plot. You watch it for the plot and how well it's executed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're, it's execution is everything. Yeah. Uh, that, that's where you get characterization and tone and dialogue and themes and uh, you know everything else that contributes to um, the the depth of a of a series or a book that it's all about execution so I mean if you're you know for most students when they're reading Shakespeare for the first time if they're reading a, a tragedy they know how it ends they like right. I mean you just know it's a tragedy like there's nothing surprising like I I mean I knew from the second I started watching Breaking Bad I went oh it's a tragedy okay he's gonna die right <laughs> everyone's yeah. gonna die essentially <laughs> everyone of significance it's like you you watch Hamlet and you're just like yeah this isn't gonna end well you're watching Macbeth it's not gonna end right. well you know that <laughs> Romeo and Juliet you know it's not gonna end well it's a tragedy it's just right there in the actual um tone of it yeah uh, like um, the entire conceit of it so I don't think that that spoils it necessarily right. and there's yeah. so many great surprises along the way that 
um, even knowing that. Because, I mean, everybody knew it. Everybody knew Walt was not going to, you know, make right. it out of this. Like, you know, even Brian Cranston has talked about it before when they talk about ending the series. And he was saying, like, well, I mean, he gets diagnosed essentially with terminal cancer in episode one in the pilot how long right. can the show go on for <laughs> like no matter what he's not getting out of this alive so yeah yeah no absolutely um yeah and and i agree like i, I don't think that it you know it doesn't put me off from right you know watching the series or anything right um but uh yeah just going off of uh with that a little bit more is uh saul goodman no idea. All I know is that he probably ends up representing uh, Brian Cranston's character at some point. That's okay. about all that I know. And I don't okay. even know if that's accurate, but that's just like what I assume. <laughs> all right. What do you make then, before I get into this, because we might as well start here, what do you make of the flash forwards where it's in black and white and you've got Jimmy McGill slash Saul Goodwin slash Gene working at a Cinnabon in, I'm pretty sure it does say in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. What, what Uh, do you make of those sequences that we get at the beginning of most episodes? uh, I just take them to be like, uh, you know, um, uh, it, it explains where he's going to end up in that he's going to, uh, eventually get in with the wrong people or get on the bad side of some people. And so now he's in hiding and uh, yeah, just working in this Cinnabon and and keeping a low profile, all that. Sure. So it's working perfect. It's doing exactly what it should be doing. Cause like the thing is I watch it and I'm like, well, I I know what's happening. Right. But, (laughs) and I'm like, and I think somebody who hasn't watched Breaking Bad would catch this. It would be completely, completely apparent of what's going on but at the same time going but i don't know for sure how well (laughs) this is working (laughs) um yeah so that that's helpful so there is so much that i admire about vince gilligan as a screenwriter and as a showrunner and once i started mapping it out in all the different character groups that we have i started having so much not so much more appreciation but i guess I'm able to see what he's doing. Like, like, you know what I mean? If you learn enough about, um, let, let's say if you go to, um, like the, like if you go to an orchestra, right. And then you watch the conductor and mm. if you don't know anything, then it just looks like magic. Right. <laughs> right. And the way it all comes together and the way he, he or she is guiding the entire orchestra. But then if the more you learn, the more you recognize specifically what the maestro is doing right the the conductor like when he or she is actually conducting and that's what i'm doing i'm looking at this going okay i see because when you're watching the show does it not feel like it's just kind of meandering yeah that it's yeah there are definitely uh uh, i don't know there's so many different things that are all going on in this one town that seem just unrelated um yeah but, sort of yeah. like, I, I I mean, ooh, I don't know if I should say this, but I guess I might as well. Let's be controversial. Um, like an even more sophisticated or talented Tarantino when it mm. comes to Pulp Fiction. Right. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. Tarantino definitely is doing that with Pulp Fiction, but it's such, mm. because it's a movie, and I love Pulp Fiction. I absolutely love that movie. But because yeah. it's a movie, then he's not as patient with the different character groups and the time jumps, but it's very much in that style of Pulp Fiction, except extended out, like telescoped out. Yeah. uh, Where you've got disconnected character groups and storylines that you've got a sense, well, there's a reason why they're all on the same show and that this is all in the (laughs) same town taking place at the same time. So we understand that they're going to start getting woven together in various ways. But it's it's a complex tapestry of Absolutely. story arcs that we have <laughs> that we know are going to get woven together. And I think by the time this is all said and done, between Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad, I don't I, I don't know if anybody's going to be able to point to better television writing ever. Mm. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like maybe that's me just being, um, you know, too appreciative of the series, but. 
what he's doing is brilliant. So let me just go through the different character groups. So you've got Saul slash Jimmy McGill or James McGill or Slip mm-hmm. and Jimmy, depending on where we're at in the time sequence. Or right. even Gene, depending right. on where we're at in the time <laughs> sequences. But we have got four different personas. And I guess one of them is the real person, but you've got three personas and the real James McGill. Okay. Mm-hmm. From there, you've got his brother Chuck and then everything that's going on with HHM. So you've got Howard, um, and then the people from the mail room, and we don't really get too much beyond that in season one, but you've got HHM. So you've got Jimmy, HHM, Kim is involved with HHM, but I'm kind of separating her out over on this side because she's really Jimmy's friend and not so much just one of Howard and Chuck's cronies. Yeah. Um, Then as you go through the series, the first um, kind of, storyline that we have involves the Kettlemans, which is Craig and Betsy. Right. Um, And they are just the, uh, I'll just say it right off the bat, like the absolute epitome of white privilege. Uh, (laughs) I just want to punch them so hard. They are just the epitome of white privilege. They are the most irritating characters imaginable. And at the same time, they're believable. Yep. (laughs) We'll we'll talk more about them, but I just couldn't resist because they're, they've just, they're both so punchable. Um, Yeah. Uh, don't punch a woman and all this, but it's a fictional character, people, for yeah, one yeah. thing. <laughs> it's a fictional character. And uh, I'm, you know, using rhetoric here. I don't actually, I'm not advocating for violence. Uh, okay. And then you've got, getting into the, like, continuing on with James um, or Jimmy's um, friendships, and you've got Marco, his best friend from Cicero, Illinois. Mm-hmm. Where we get that in a flashback, um, like a, a basically an entire episode of that. You've then got Mike Ermintrout, and you've got everything that's going on with Mike. Mm-hmm. So you've got Mike, his deceased son, Maddie. You've got his um, daughter-in-law, Stacy, um, his son's wife, um, and and then um, the his granddaughter, Kaylee. Okay, so you've got Mike as a character group. Then bringing us into the criminal underground world because the Kettleman sort of are, but not really, right? Like it's just the most incompetent to even call them criminals, like would be, and it's not <laughs> underground, the boat sitting in their driveway. <laughs> like, right. There's nothing it's underground. So stupid. About <laughs> <laughs> but as far as our entry point into the criminal underground world, then we get introduced to Dr. Caldera um, or Caldera, Caldera, Caldera. Anyway, uh, the the veterinarian who is an actual veterinarian, but he's got these connections to the criminal underground. Um, And then from there, then we get connected to Price, who plays Nate from The Office, which is always how I think of this, you know, actor. You know, <laughs> yeah. I can get you more pills <laughs> with his like. I, I'm yeah. assuming it's Minnesota or maybe Wisconsin. I'm not sure his accent, mm-hmm. but um, anyway. So you've got Price, this dorky, you know, like fanny pack wearing. I don't know that he actually wears a fanny pack, but he's the type of dude to wear a fanny pack driving his minivan, and obviously works in a pharmaceutical. Uh, manufacturing plant or something along those lines because he's able to get these pills. So then we get from there uh, connected to the Salamancas who are part of the cartel operating in New Mexico. So you've then got Nacho, Nacho Varga, who is buying the pills from Price, but he's doing it, as Mike explains, separately from his crew of the Salamancas. He's doing it, you know, on the down low and he doesn't want them to find out. Because he's just doing this thing, um, you know, as, as a side um, enterprise. And then we also get introduced to Tuco Salamanca, who is the guy who's very upset that they call his grandmother uh, a biatch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's basically all of the different character groups. Um, but then, and, and I'm almost finished here, and then I want to get into the different character groups. But as far as storylines, you've got a bunch of things happening. So you've got basically now, then. So you have what's happening now, what happened back then, and what's happening in the future. So the future we don't get very much of. We just get Gene working at a Cinnabon. Right. So that's, you know, next or the future. As yeah, far as what's happening now, 
we start out with the Kettleman's. Um, from there, Jimmy's able to resolve this. He's able to, like, well, he, first he, he catches them camping, right? <laughs> because Nacho approaches him and, you know, says, hey, we should rip these people off because they've stolen the money. They can't go to the police and they're great targets. And then Jimmy is like, ooh, I don't know how I feel about this Kettleman's. You got to run for it, right? So they go camping and they keep the money and all of this. They pay him a retainer. Right. right? <laughs> Even though it's obviously a bribe. And um, he used this money to then, you know, he says, you know, upon this rock, I shall build my church, right? Quoting mm -hmm. um, scripture. And he then, you know, gets the billboard where he mimics the, everything to do with HHM. And um, from there, he starts getting contacted by, like, he, he ends up working with all of these elderly people doing wills. From there, that then leads him into everything that's going on with Sam Piper Crossing, which ends up being turning into this huge class action lawsuit that kind of pulls him back into the world of HHM. Because going back into the then, into the past, we find out that initially he was still living in Cicero, Illinois, where they grew up as Slippin' Jimmy, just this two-bit con man who's going nowhere and all of this. He gets arrested because he poops through a guy's sunroof with the children in the back seat. <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> Hey, what, um, is it, what, is, what is it called again? <laughs> Chicago sunroof or something like that? <laughs> yeah, something like that. I think that's what it is. <laughs> anyway, so Chuck bails him out, but only under the agreement that he's going to get his, that Jimmy will get his act together. He will essentially move out to Albuquerque. This is presumed, because it's kind of taking place off screen, but this mm -hmm. is essentially what Jimmy tells Marco, who is his best friend, then He's going to go to Albuquerque. He's going to start working for Chuck. He's going to, you know, get on the straight and narrow. And he promises Chuck that he's never going to do any of these illegal things again, that he's not slipping Jimmy anymore, that mm -hmm. that thing is over. So he starts working for Chuck, spends years working at HHM in the mailroom, seemingly a pretty affable, likable guy in the office, but... Mm -hmm. Not anything, just a mailroom worker who is really into movies and like the, you know, Oscar picks and things like that. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but he's also going to law school secretly and mm -hmm. he's doing this, um, you know, through correspondence with, um, you know, the University of is it the University of American Samoa? Go yes. land crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's I love that. Go land crabs. It's like, ooh, <laughs> as a mascot, that just <laughs> not sure that no, any no, college... a land crab. <laughs> I'm not sure that any college should have as their mascot crabs. <laughs> Go crabs. <laughs> um so he, he he does that. And then this is all taking place in the past. He doesn't get hired at HHM because of um Howard. Right. But it's yeah. not really because of Howard. It's because of Chuck. Yeah. And so that's ultimately what pushes him into becoming a public defender. And he's not really making any money from that. So then that's what pulls us into the now, which is then the Kettleman's. He's able to get enough money that he's able to get the billboard to do the advertising, which pulls him into um, elder law, which then pulls him into the Sandpiper Crossing. Um, conspiracy that's going on, this criminal undertaking that this real estate corporation is is undertaking. So you see how it all like actually pulls together yeah. in terms of Jimmy's story, but you look at that and you're like, you literally are dealing with three different time periods, but two in detail, but they all connect and they all resonate with each other. They all rhyme with each other of mm. Jimmy becoming, like he's slipping Jimmy, no, 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 I'll be good. And then as a lawyer, it's like, ooh, maybe I'll do this bad thing. No, 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 I'll be a good lawyer. Yeah. Um, and it's all connected <laughs> back to Chuck. And then kind of a separate thing that's happening in the midst of all of this is why Mike has arrived in Albuquerque and what he's doing there and Mike's backstory of what took place in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. So that's season one. I think right. I've done a pretty good job of, of going through that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, that was uh, really, really well done. Um, yeah, and there is just so much going on. And that's why, yeah. like, when we had kind of talked about, like, oh, yeah, we should do a, a Better Call Saul podcast. And it was like, 
how do we even do that? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's like season by season, I think it is a fair way of trying to approach this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So can we just go then through character groups? Sure. Um, all right, I guess, I don't know if you want to start with the most significant one. I feel like I'd rather start with some of the minor character groups and save the Jimmy and Chuck for the end. Sure. Because yeah, yeah. that's the... That's the one that deserves the most attention and mm-hmm. that everything else I'd rather resolve, um, you know, fairly swiftly and then move on. Right. Uh, yeah, if uh, if we could start off with uh, Nacho and um, uh, Price. That whole... Price. <laughs> Is that his? Oh, yeah, yeah, Price. <laughs> right. The, uh, the nerdy guy. Yeah. I was thinking of the other... Um, uh, drug dealer, and now I can't remember his Tuco? name. Tuco? Yes, Tuco. I just want to call him Miho. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the name Tuco of the episode. Solomon. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so I understand that both of those characters are in uh, Breaking Bad, is that correct? Yes. Nacho and Tuco? Yes. Um, yeah, and I don't know much beyond that. <laughs> but, okay. Uh, uh, but yeah, and I think that it's it's really fascinating how we get introduced to them by you know this whole yeah uh, <laughs> Jimmy just trying to do this one little con job that he knows right. will be perfect right. and then he you know gets these two teenage dudes to uh, te- dudes teenage is skaters. the right word <laughs> those yeah. guys are dudes <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, and he's just like, okay, yeah, yeah, you can take a fall, it's fine, you know, you'll just get hit by this one car, and then we'll get, you know, payday. And they do not believe him at all. Right. <laughs> um, and oh goodness, does it go wrong, because apparently there are two different cars that are nearly identical. Yeah. Surprisingly, <laughs> uh, driving yeah. the same street at the same time. I'm not saying that it's unbelievable. It's just you can see why they wouldn't have prepared for that. It's yeah. not like, oh, it's a silver minivan or something right. like that. It, it's, yeah. you know, like this old um, station wagon, right? Is yeah, it not a station you... wagon or is it a sedan? Uh, I don't remember. I think it's a station wagon. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and and that also, I, I think, is interesting because Jimmy points out he's like the license plate starts with this. It's yep. you know this exact uh, paint color and all that. Uh, and I get the sense that you know the two dudes were not paying as much attention, and no. it was a different license plate and you know yeah. slightly different paint color, all that, right? <laughs> but why would you assume, wait, let's wait. No, no, no I know, there, but it's just, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's something that Jimmy would have paid attention to. <laughs> yes, presumably. Yeah. The way that he, you know, focused on it, that it seems yeah. like he would have uh, yeah. made sure. But uh, yeah, so, um, man, and that's really like the first time that we get into like all the, drug dealing and all that all this underground uh cartel stuff um and it's so funny that it's like it's it's so great that it's done by accident that it's you know jimmy is not trying to get involved with it he does not want to have anything to do with that but the second that he does one thing that's just a little bit uh sketchy then he gets roped right into the criminal underbelly (laughs) absolutely so one thing that is a, a late motif of Better Call Saul slash Breaking Bad, so just a recurring theme, is essentially the slippery slope of being involved in criminal behavior. Mm. That it is, many criminals begin their criminal careers thinking it is a one-time thing. Right. That, yeah. is, a, that is a big late motif throughout both of these shows. It's, let me just dabble in this you know immoral illegal unethical however you want to describe it but certainly illegal activity and justifying it and justifying it but let me just let me just dip my toe in and then go whoop (laughs) and you know you just you slide (laughs) right down and then you're in over your head before you even know it and it's not even so much a cautionary tale i mean you could take it as a cautionary tale but that's not the intention behind 
these shows. Um, you know, it's it's. I don't think that that's the intention. It's more exploring who this character is, and Jimmy just right. can't help it. Right. That, that's yeah. it's a character study. It's not a it's not a morality tale. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So he just he sees this perfect opportunity and he can't help himself and then he ends up all of a sudden being involved in this and, and this is one of those things that i think most people understand that you know hey if you even if you had the ability to start selling something like to start selling drugs like if you found a bunch of drugs and you just want to do a one-time deal like there's literally a a, a documentary on netflix called i forget the full name of it but i think it, it might just be called cocaine island and it's mm. a dude from florida who hears about this money in i think uh puerto rico and then or sorry not money um cocaine he mm. goes finds it and it's like it's just a disaster it's it's an amazing documentary this florida man finds bag of cocaine not a drug <laughs> dealer decides to try to make a one-time score and things don't go so well um Gotcha. It, it's one of those things that if you understand what's happening in Better Call Saul and in Breaking Bad, then you look at this and you say that the, it seems to be this idea that you can't just do a little bit of criminal activity because there are people who have dedicated their entire lives to this and you have no idea whose toes you're going to step on. Right. That yeah. if you're going to go the life of being a, a criminal – You've got to go all in or not at all. Right. But just dabbling is ultimately a pretty bad idea. Mm -hmm. that it, it, so it's not so much cautionary. It's just saying if you want to exercise wisdom, you either have to take this entirely seriously or avoid it altogether. Right. Like the Kettleman's yeah. are a good example of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Like just go full criminal or don't <laughs> don't think that you can still be law abiding good people. Um, yeah. I wanted to mention, though, because I like what you're you're saying as far as how we get introduced to this entire underworld of the, the drug world and cartel world going on in Albuquerque. But you've got the two, the the skateboarders and their twin brothers. Do you not like notice like the significance of this, of the fact that is that kind of what Jimmy wants? Right. Him and mm. Chuck. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> working together. He wants yeah. to work with Chuck so desperately. Like, yeah. these guys work together. And it's like, he tries. And, I mean, I'm kind of jumping ahead here. But it, it's, it relates to these characters that we are first introduced to so early in the show. Yeah. That they are two brothers who are working so closely together. Sure, they're doing some con job. That this mm -hmm. is, you know, they're con artists. But at least they're working together. And it's yeah. like... Chuck won't go that route with Jimmy. He yeah. won't be a criminal with him. And then Jimmy's like, well, that's all that I'm really good at. And since I want to spend time with my brother and I want to be working with him and I want his uh, approval and all of this stuff, since I can't get that in the criminal world, I'll try going the law abiding way. And, yeah. you know, just being in the mailroom, well, what if I can end up being his peer and I go to law school and I'd be a lawyer? And then when it just doesn't work and it doesn't work and it doesn't work, this is ultimately what pulls Jimmy back into the slipping Jimmy persona. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. But these um, guys seem to be like it, it's it's intentional that they're brothers. Yes. Working yeah, together um, yeah. and actually getting along. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, and uh, within that story as well, I I love the way that Jimmy, you know, uses his lawyer skills in order yes. to talk them down to just a, one broken leg each right. from all three of them being, you know, outright murdered. So, right. Um, and this is, this is essentially, this is one of the, the biggest character traits if not the defining character trait of James McGill or Jimmy McGill, it's that his superpower is his mouth. It, right. it is his yeah. skill with words. And even though Chuck is an incredible lawyer, Chuck is in, he is a brilliant um, 
researcher. thinker, scholar yeah. of the law. He's a brilliant scholar of the law, and he definitely is going to, if there is a way to formulate any kind of legal argument to win a case or to settle a case, Chuck will figure it out. Yeah. But Jimmy has got this superpower in terms of being able to use rhetoric to convince people, to persuade people to his position. And he yeah. can do this in just unbelievable ways at times, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. <laughs> that it is. And this is where uh, I don't think this spoils anything. It, it doesn't spoil anything with Breaking Bad. But Walt's superpower, essentially, is that he is a world class chemist, mm. right? That that is uh, essentially what we admire about him. That's one of the things that we admire so much about him is that he is a world class chemist. And then taking that idea of our principal character in Breaking Bad is going to have this admirable skill that whether it's used for good or whether it's used for illegal purposes, it is an admirable skill. So you can either apply this to be a chemist working in, you know, working for a pharmaceutical company, completely legal, all above board, or you can end up going into the criminal underground world and you you make methamphetamine and you're doing this for illegal purposes. That Jimmy is the same type of protagonist that we have in Better Call Saul, where he's got this superpower. He is a world-class, um, you know, rhetorician, I, I guess. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, and not just that, because even, uh, yeah, he, he is so skilled with just his, his social skills are, yeah. you know, way, way above the line. Like they're so incredible because he, and, and, you know, he does, it, it can be read as, you know, like manipulation to some degree, but not in a malicious way. Right. Um, uh, you know, like with the old people where he dresses as like Matlock or whoever. Yeah, so you know? brilliant. Yeah. It's like, of course, you know, he's going to try to look like who they They're all. They're going to be comfortable with. Yeah. They're going to be familiar with that. Yeah. It's, it's so brilliant. And I love it. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're watching it. And at first you're just like, okay, he's watching this show. And so he's just trying to learn from TV. That's stupid. And then you see that he's drawing the suit and yep. it's like, oh, he just wants to look like that and he's guy. taking detail. It is so brilliant. Like, Absolutely. when you look at this writing, <laughs> that you just go, that is so genius. This idea, because it misleads the viewer, because you think, oh, no, he's going to try to be a lawyer by watching Matlock. And, and <laughs> right. you're like, but he's like linen suit, you know, like, yep. you know, blue tie, <laughs> like, whatever. He's making all of his notes on this. And um, it's it's a great he he is this but my point though is that and you're absolutely right because it's not just his words it's the way he's able to manipulate or persuade people and mm. his social skills they are just off the charts that it is to the point of i call it a superpower right that yeah, he, yeah. he is so above the what ordinary people are capable of doing when it comes to interacting with strangers um, or even people he's incredibly familiar with that he can persuade and manipulate people through his social skills and he can either use that for good or he can use this for illegal activities which is the entire premise of breaking bad it's you've got this skill set how are you going to use this and what a brilliant theme to focus on for a tv series to yeah. to say that you can either uh, you know everything can be used for good or evil mm -hmm. right yeah. that it's just it's a tool and the tool itself is neutral and or i mean we can look at it and we can say well that's an admirable tool like it's it's very impressive it has a lot of power how are you going to use it yeah. and um yeah that it just it it rhymes well with breaking bad mm -hmm. yeah no that's that's really interesting the way that it works with that because yeah like i just look at it you know with <laughs> Of course, just with Better Call Saul, and I'm just like, yeah, right. it works so well for Jimmy. But right, yeah. Um, okay, so did you have anything else to to say with Nacho or Tuco? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, did you want to move on to Price then? <laughs> um, yeah. So Price is is such an interesting character to me, even though we don't get very much of him in this. Um, but. 
mm-hmm. the way we first meet him, first of all, is hilarious. Like you can't not mention the fact, like that whole interaction that Mike has with uh, the the two other dudes when they're waiting for Price to show up to pick them up to go and do the joint deal. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I forget the uh, the character's name from The Walking Dead, but. Yeah, yeah, you know the guy that he ultimately like hits, like that he takes the gun from him. It's like, how do yeah. you not bring a gun, that yeah. dude? <laughs> and um, and so anyway, he, I've got uh, at least three that I'm willing to tell you about. That I'm willing to tell you about. <laughs> it, a, a lot of people have pointed this out that, in it, and it is very much a Gilligan style of, of writing that with Breaking Bad and with Better Call Saul, as much as they are intense crime thrillers they're also incredibly funny mm, yeah. <laughs> like like that see that that scene is so funny when you see mike who just you know then like hits the guy and takes the gun and he's like you know yeah. like what are you packing pimento <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah um and then the other oh, giant man. dude just runs away but when it comes to to price he's an interesting character i think in part because I watch Better Call Saul and I think Breaking Bad. So I, 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 I take a lot of those principles and I apply it because he's obviously a regular dude who, you know, he's wearing khakis and running shoes and he's got his like polo shirt on. He's driving a minivan and yeah. he is not tough in or, or threatening in any way whatsoever, right? There's <laughs> nothing intimidating about Price, but he's trying to dip his toe into the criminal world of of drug dealing Mm -hmm. and thinking i could just do it a little bit right Right. maybe if i do it once and then at the end of that first meeting that he has with nacho then you know when he's in the the van and he's talking to mike then price says you know well i'm not a criminal and then he's like, what you just did is criminal activity, right? And then he goes through this whole thing. It's like, I've known good criminals and bad cops. That that whole thing. Like, yeah. Mike has got a lot of really great lines throughout the, this season. Mm-hmm. And pointing out whether you think you're a good person or a bad person doesn't change the fact that you are a criminal at this point. So the right. point is what do you want to do? Do you want to continue being a criminal? Like it's a slippery slope that you think that you can just kind of dip your toe in and maybe you can, maybe Price can, and he can just pull himself back out. Um, Because the reason why I think it's so significant to talk about is that this is ultimately what happens with Mike and with his son, Maddie, where Mm -hmm. Maddie refuses to dip a toe even a little bit into bribery and embezzlement and you know getting paid off and being connected to the the mob and whatever all that stuff that's going on yeah. within the philadelphia police department at least within their precinct that because he refuses he's like no i won't i won't i won't and mike's like everybody was on the take everybody that nobody could then be responsible because we're all guilty that you can't turn in anybody because that implicates you yeah. that That's essentially what's happening here with Price. Price wants to believe that he's still a good, upstanding citizen, that he's not doing anything wrong. Nobody's going to miss these pills. It's a small amount and all of these things that he's ultimately not doing any harm. And Mike is saying, like, no, you've crossed a line here. Whether you want to admit it or not, you have crossed a line. And I'm not judging you on a character basis. I'm not saying you have bad character or you're a bad person. That's still undetermined whether you continue on this path or not. You can be law abiding and be a terrible person and you can be a criminal, but actually be a pretty good person, according to the logic that we have throughout Better Call Saul. So Price, then his response to it is not I'm a like he doesn't really continue on with the I'm a good person or I don't know about being a criminal. He just says, well, I can get more pills. (laughs) Right. Like it's just. He doesn't seem to want to have that big metaphysical conversation about his the ethical implications of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he just is thinking, well, that worked. I didn't get in trouble. That went well. There was no shootout. I didn't get beat up. They didn't rob me. I was able to take these pills from work, and I've now got a envelope full of cash. Yeah. So 
I can do this again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, again, like that conversation does, you know, tie back to, uh, uh, to Jimmy where, you know, he's always telling Chuck, like, it's all perfectly legal. It's all perfectly legal. Right. And it's like, yeah, but just because it's legal doesn't mean that Precisely. it's good. <laughs> it's Precisely. Like, you can still be bad even if you are doing the legal thing. <laughs> right. And surprisingly enough, it is the crooked retired cop who is a murderer and is helping out you know these criminals in this criminal underground world mm. who is the moral center of the show <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> yeah because <laughs> it sure as hell isn't chuck yeah yeah he's a sure. law-abiding lawyer it's not howard um it's not kim even though you could argue that it's kim but it's not because she kind of gets a kick out of jimmy's ability to be a con man right yeah and so it it's not her it is mike who seems to be the moral centerpiece of this show who is instructing us and instructing other characters when and where he can but it seems like nobody really is interested <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah no absolutely um all right, yeah, so we've talked uh, a little bit about uh, Mike, and uh, I wasn't particularly interested in his character at first. I right. thought that his appearance was more of a cameo thing because, you know, mm -hmm. again, like I watched like the first episode with uh, Amanda and David who were like, right. oh, it's that guy, you know, he's in he's in Breaking Bad. And I was like, oh, okay, like whatever. Then he's just like, oh, this is what he happened to do before he was part of that series it was just right. working at this toll booth thing um but uh but yeah and then we get into um you know him working with uh with price and everything and i'm like okay now i actually really like this character it wasn't until then that i was really like oh i like this character because before that then i was just like i don't care about this guy he just seems like you know a grump and i don't know it, 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 all this stuff like with the sun i'm like this isn't important to the law stuff <laughs> agreed and that is where i'm really surprised about what gilligan and the other um writers have done with better call saul it's mm. so surprising because the show even though it's called better call saul we don't even really get saul goodman until like season four in the very end of season four which mm. i'm not really spoiling anything but i'm saying like he doesn't even really go by saul goodman yeah. for the longest time so it's like we're going to title this show better call saul what's the main character's name jimmy is there anybody <laughs> on the show named saul mm, no not for like 40 plus episodes <laughs> yeah i was very confused when i first started watching i was like so why is it called better call saul? oh that's the name that he goes by later on eventually yes okay i still don't get it <laughs> right but so that's the first part is calling it that when it doesn't seem to be about that but it, that's why i'm saying that it works for me as a Breaking Bad fan, then it works. Because I understand where this is going. Right. I yeah. know the, the not necessarily, um, I know where this is going to end up several years down the line. Right. right. I'll say that. But the other surprising thing is that the show is in many ways just as much about Mike as it is about Jimmy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And in a satisfying way it's not at first it seems frustrating yeah but it makes perfect sense and you don't really get this too much in season one so i'm somewhat spoiling uh, better call saul seasons two three and four and kind of but i mean as long as you've got some sense of what happens in breaking bad like you're fine but i'm just saying if somebody wants to skip ahead 30 seconds that's fine but mm -hmm. Because it's connected into the Breaking Bad universe, then Saul Goodman is not our entry point into that world. It's Mike, okay. right? It's yeah. it's like, because you can see from the show, it's Mike who's involved immediately yeah, yeah. in season one. Saul, like yeah. Jimmy has nothing to do with the with the Salamancas. He meets Tuco, but that's right. not because of anything to do with the cartel. That was yeah, just yeah. <laughs> some con job gone wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah. But as far as how does this show connect to Breaking Bad, then it's like, well, there was 
this huge cartel presence going on in Albuquerque and throughout the American Southwest. And so we need to know what's happening before Walt starts in on all of this. And as a result, how do we get into that if Saul Goodman wasn't involved in that? Well, we have Mike. So if we just introduce Mike, he is our entry point into the underground the criminal underground and that's why i think he's such a prominent part of the show because that's a side story that's happening that's pretty disconnected from what's happening with james mcgill right yeah and there's a reason for this is ultimately they are going to intersect but they're not going to intersect for a really really long time right so yeah As far as my admiration for Vince Gilligan, like that's a big part of it is that Vince Gilligan respects his viewers so much. He treats them like actual adults, intelligent adults who have patience and are willing to see through storylines for dozens of hours before Mm. they're going to start connecting. That (laughs) literally we were talking dozens of hours of screen time before these storylines even start intersecting that even though we know they're happening at the same time, he's just going, people will be patient. They'll wait for it. (laughs) And and good, intelligent, mature viewers will. And viewers who won't would not like the show anyway. Right. (laughs) That's just not their audience. If you want like immediate payoffs, you know, somebody getting like hit with a pie every three seconds, then, you know. Go watch, watch something The Walking else. Dead. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Watch The Walking Dead. I was going to say watch Impractical Jokers, but <laughs> I don't even, I've never watched a second of that. That might be an inaccurate representation. I don't know. I'm just saying from what I understand, it's kind of like, you know, bits that they have along the way where you don't have to wait too long for a punchline. Right. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, then I guess we might as well keep going with Mike, if you're okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. So... I think you're right that at first when you see him, then it just, it doesn't make any sense. As far as the introduction to Mike though, it's so brilliant to me because I don't know if you've noticed this, but he is literally a troll under a bridge operating a toll booth. (laughs) For a guy who kind of is troll-like in his demeanor, you know, and like to some extent his physical appearance, you know what I mean? He's not uh, like gonna gonna win any, um, you know, handsomest man in Albuquerque contests, right? Right. I'm not like, I'm not being like, harsh i'm just saying that he looks tough he looks intimidating right and he yeah. just looks so grumpy and with his overall demeanor of his you know um as walter describes him his dead eyes i feel yeah. like that's just such a great description because they're kind of half closed and they never really right. respond to things he's not like expressive <laughs> right he just looks exhausted and angry with everyone like not even angry but just exasperated right. yeah he's just Ugh, I'm just here. You guys are going to do your thing. Whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> exactly. It's not enough stamps. Oh, it's not my problem. Go back in, get more stamps, or pay the toll. You know, just that yep. <laughs> flat, affectless attitude that he has towards everybody. But he is essentially a, not just essentially, he is acting as a troll under a bridge controlling a a toll booth and and that's our introduction to him and then we find out why he's in albuquerque Mm -hmm. so then when you get into his whole backstory and i think it's the the scene at the end of i don't know i think it's episode eight episode seven or eight something like that where he ultimately reveals to his daughter-in-law um what happened with her husband with his son and what he did about it and that that amazing scene that incredibly affecting scene that's just so emotional and powerful it that is it sneaks up on you because you never see him really emote in any way and then it's just it's all there and you realize oh this man has the Every I love every line of dialogue that he says there and what ends up being a monologue where he ends up saying, you know, like with his son, that he 
encouraged him to take the bribe, but because he kind of hesitated in taking it, then even that is enough to show that he's not fully committed and they can't trust him. And that he says, you know, and you know, that as his father, he didn't like, he was like, his son was stronger than him. It was a better Mm -hmm. man than him. And it didn't make him better. He made him lesser to say that about your own son and to then have the guilt of it's my fault that he, he died. And even though he kills the guys, the, the police officers who have murdered his son, even though he's killed them, that doesn't do anything. And yeah. Mike is now at a point in his life where it seems like it, he's got no significant other. He's got no romantic interest in his life. He has no son. And as far as we can tell, no family members, no friends. He was a, in a raging alcoholic in Philadelphia. And when he arrives in Albuquerque, he's still like essentially sobering up, mm-hmm. right? That he, he, um, because that that appears to be what he was struggling through. Because he even describes that to his friend who who shows up, one of the internal affair, uh, internal affairs um, investigators. Um, You know the the older black guy who sits down beside him, and then, you know, he's like, "How do you feel?" And he's like, "Like I crawled out of a bottle, right?" Like he's still struggling through um, the early stages of what seems to be sobriety for him. Mm -hmm. Um, That you look at this and you're like in some ways what does he have left to live for and it really seems to be his granddaughter and taking care of his daughter-in-law of caring for both of them because his son is no longer there to be able to care for for his you know wife and his daughter so mike is like well i'll try to help wherever i can if stacy will allow me to help yeah and that seems to be his entire purpose at this point to just not trying to change their lives, but to bring just a little bit of goodness into their life that he has got such modest goals in life to try to help even a little, just watching Kaylee just for an hour, you know, to pick her up from, you know, preschool or or daycare or whatever it is. Like, yeah, his character is, yeah, so fascinating. You do have all of that going on with his uh, with his daughter-in-law and his granddaughter, and it is so incredibly uh, emotional. And you get why he is, um, you know, so so keen on helping them because yeah. he does feel like it's his fault that you know that they are on their own that they yes. don't have. Um, you know, Maddie there anymore. Um, and it's, uh, you, so you have all of that going on. And then even the fact that he is so strict with the stamps, then, you know, you get it once you know all of that about his son, because you're like, oh, he's trying to be like, you know, living up to his son's, uh, uh, you know, status or, or um, yeah, uh, moral uh, standard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where he's like, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, if I know you or, you know, oh, you know, who's going to miss the two dollars or whatever. He's like, it doesn't matter. This is what's what the rules are. And we all have to follow the rules. And so it's this interesting thing of him being so specific where it's like no nobody is getting around the rules like i am going to make sure that everybody follows the rules that everybody does the right thing um and that's how we start off with him and so it's interesting that we start to get him moving away from that toward like the end of the season with him Mm. you know working with price and everything yeah where it's like he's getting over um uh the mourning period uh of his son where he's starting to forgive himself, where he's starting to be yes. like, you know, well, I still need to provide for, uh, you know, for those that that he left. Um, and one way of doing that is by getting back into this, you know, unsavory uh, criminal world in order to, you know, get a little bit more money or, or whatever it is. Yeah. I I really like that reading 
I really, really like that reading that as he is moving through the grieving process, he then, and, and in some ways, respecting the rules of the toll booth mm. is his way of honoring his son and trying to be yeah. more like his son. But then as he starts moving on and healing, then he starts going back and I say back into this criminal underground world, because even though he was a police officer, he was obviously on the take. He was doing right. illegal things. Um, yeah. So I wonder, I, I can't remember what is the inciting event that causes him to go back to the veterinarian and ask about the jobs available because I know, I, and it it's terrible because I should have looked that up before we started talking. And even though I had just watched, rewatched season one, I don't remember what the inciting event is that gets him there. Because he, he shows up again with the dog. Right. To get the checkup. So that's kind of the excuse of being able to talk to the, the vet, to Dr. Yeah. Caldera. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's... Uh... Is it because... Stacy starts allowing him to spend time with Kaylee. Yeah, possibly. I, I, I know. I'm trying to think of what it was exactly uh, now as well. And it is, you know, hard to keep track of, uh, as we had mentioned, all these different storylines yeah. and, and everything. But, storylines um, and, and time periods and all yeah. of this stuff. Yeah. And, and, and character groups. It's, uh, yeah, so I think that it was... Um, I think that it's because he's able to spend time because at first, because Stacy was so suspicious of him and mm. she didn't know, she thought that it was Mike who called her husband the night that he died that, you know, and there was the big fight that thinking like, what did you have to do with this? With, right. you know, she's suspicious about how he died. And then it, it, she doesn't want him to spend any time with her daughter. Mm -hmm. Right. That yeah. we see that initially that she isn't, as best I remember, she just drives right past him, that he shows yeah. up and he's looking, you know, like sitting outside of her house and she looks at him. They don't say a word and then she keeps driving. But then ultimately she then asks him if he can pick up Kaylee um, mm. because she's not able to get there um, from daycare. I think it's that because I think it's that Mike wants to provide and so yeah. knowing that the criminal underground is like the world of criminality is going to provide him with enough money to easily support them. Yeah. But what else can a retired police officer who is suspected of murder, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. What else yeah. can he do? Uh, like if it's working at a toll booth, he's, you know, presumably making minimum wage or pretty close to it. Yeah. So and since he has a particular skill set, then he's able to then exploit that to try to bring some good into the world. Because he does say that to Stacy when she's asking him about the money um, that she finds, you know, like $5,000 or something in a suitcase. And then saying, what should I do with this money? And she she thought about giving it to a church, you know, putting it in a collection plate or, or doing something like that. And she's like, is it okay if I spend it? She asked Mike um, if it's yeah. okay. And then he says, if that little bit of money can, you know, bring any goodness into the world, like then, you know, spend it, like do whatever you can. And that seems to be his attitude. It's like I say, he's got such, uh, um, you know, humble goals. Mm -hmm. um, it, this is a little bit, I, I don't know that how much of this spoils Breaking Bad, but it, I don't think it really does. Mike, in comparison to Walt, Walt has got such lofty goals of he, you know, wants to like his ambition and, and his desire to earn all of this money for his family is like up here. And Mike is just like, just a little bit, just even a little bit that can make my family's life a little bit better is worth it. He just wants a little bit of goodness in the world. He's not trying to change things and change the system or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, so he, he really does become such a fascinating character as we get toward the end of season one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and 
yeah, and rewatching it than I did, you know, start to pick up on things like the, you know, the his insistence of following the rules of the toll booth and all that. Um, yeah, I like your reading of that because I'm not sure what to make of it. Because on the one hand, then I think I think he's just a stickler that he's just he has because he talks about this of you know with Jimmy where it, he when Jimmy hires him to steal the money from the Kettleman's. Mm. Mike steals $1.6 million <laughs> in yeah. cash, or at least pretty close to that $1.6 million. And he doesn't run off with the money and mm. doesn't even try to convince Jimmy that they should just split it between the two of them. Mm-hmm. And that's essentially how season one ends with Jimmy going like, what the hell was I thinking? You know, right. <laughs> we could split that. And like, I know what stopped me. And then he's like, what stopped you? And Mike says, you know, I was hired to do a job and I did the job like that he has got this sense of honor and i feel like i wonder how much of that is like a new mike versus how mike would have been in philadelphia as a police officer Mm. because he was on the take for sure in philadelphia but i wonder how much of it was just him justifying it to himself of saying well you know, I'm ultimately keeping the city safe. And, you know, if the mob is happy, then there's less violence on the streets. And that's ultimately serving and protecting. I wonder if that's like a justification that he had in his head right. that he's still doing the job. He's doing what he was hired to do. Yeah. Or if he is different now, because we don't get enough of him in Philadelphia to have any sense mm-hmm. of whether he was a stickler then or not. Right. Yeah. Um, but he definitely has got this sense of honor that you don't violate, even if you're doing criminal things. It's, yeah. you know, your your word is your bond. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, are we good to move on now? Yeah. All right, I want to talk about the Kettlemans. Yeah, I agree. That's <laughs> the next step. Yeah, um, it bears repeating. The epitome of white privilege, the most punchable people <laughs> on television. Um the actors are fine. Don't, don't don't hurt the actors or anything like that. But fictional right. characters, fictional characters, like whatever happens to them within this fictional universe, I'm like, yes, come up and please. <laughs> yeah, honestly, they are. Oh my goodness! Like you just know that it's all uh, it's all on Betsy too. Yep. That oh she, yeah. She convinced him to do this. That yes. it is that that she gets a kick out of it. That she, you know. Like, I don't even know how much of it is she gets a kick out of it. It's that she is so ridiculously privileged that she thinks that her husband, who's a treasurer, who has occasionally worked a little bit of overtime in the evenings and on weekends every now and then, that that yeah. is that fair compensation is one point six million dollars. If that <laughs> right. doesn't make you want to slap the hell out of her, I don't know what will. <laughs> right? That it's just yeah. like, and I, like again, I'm trying to be careful about this because I'm not like I'm not advocating for violence against people and certainly not against women but i'm saying that this idea that a person a person would say that's what my time is worth like yeah. or that's what my husband's time is worth it's like how many hours are you talking about like you're yeah. talking about like maybe like in the, like a few hundred hours even like a few thousand hours then you're still like way under like a oh, yeah. hundred grand you're like maybe like all told over 15, 20 years, like $50,000 in like extra, you know, overtime or something like that. But the fact that she has convinced herself that that's fair, that they're not, she's not stealing from society. Yeah. Right. That she's stealing from every person in that town who is paying, uh, you know, property taxes, whether you're paying it directly by owning a home or by renting a home and it's factored into your rent. Every single person in town she has stolen from and she doesn't even care. She doesn't think yeah. about any sense of victimization that she has done to people in society, right? Yeah. It is so irritating. I think it's irritating because I think almost everybody believes that there are many people in the world like that. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It is, oh, it is so irritating. The, the way that she, and like even once they're caught, then she still doesn't want to, right. you know, admit anything that she's just like, you know, oh, he, Craig can't uh, can't admit that he, that he was wrong because, you know, there, he, 
he wasn't he wasn't wrong you know he didn't do anything right and, and then she then blames other people in society you know like oh it's not like we're like those people you know cr like criminals who are like selling drugs or like robbing places and all of yeah. this stuff and it's like no like you're in some ways much worse because right. you have other opportunities you've been gifted this life of privilege where you are educated and you've grown up clearly in fairly you know like middle class uh like with a middle class background where you've had advantages whether it's education and work opportunities and all these things you could make a living doing other things if you're a kid who's grown up in you know a really tough situation where you know let's say that you know you've got like a, a single parent you know and you're living in extreme poverty and your your one parent doesn't even have much of an education and you're going to a terrible school and you're growing up in a gang neighborhood and there's no work opportunities and you know you're dealing with extra discrimination if you're an ethnic minority and all of these things then you're just like i don't know what to do i'm trying to help the family survive and nobody will hire me and all of this stuff so i turn to a life of crime and it's like yeah because you're just trying to get by her she wants a freaking boat like yeah. they already live in like a McMansion and then, <laughs> yep. and then it's like then they want more and you just like and you act like you're not in, in the wrong in any way and you're just like yeah. ah. it, it's so confusing to me too because like I don't even know what if they had a plan for what to spend the money on it certainly doesn't seem like it it seems like they just wanted the money because they wanted the money that it's just that fair compensation that they didn't really need anything or no. you know want for anything either no. and it's just like you know yeah we need to get what we are owed and then just hold on to it and they don't have any kind of plan for what to do once they have it and it's just i I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's there are so many things that are so irritating about them. The, the specifically, level, Betsy. specifically <laughs> Betsy. Yeah, the level of entitlement that she has, and the way her husband just goes along with all of this stuff. It is, it, it's infuriating because that is that is why, and and I'm not like how I, I'm genuinely not. Um, trying to make it a, a political thing but it's there is a huge amount of resentment against ultra wealthy people right mm -hmm. now like there's yeah. a huge amount of resentment um uh, whether you share that resentment or not this would be like she's a care like she's a caricature of like uh, of entitlement of well we're entitled to it because right <laughs> be, just because <laughs> we're good people and therefore you know we should have more because we want more like why wouldn't we have more that yeah. seems to be her justification for it um and yeah. then even when the the money is gone she still is thinking that she has leverage right. because she's so entitled she is so she is a woman who has gotten her way basically every moment of her life forever yeah yeah. But she's always been able to get her way and without really working that hard for things, having a really, really easy life. And she is what's so appalling is that you've got the the best standard of living in the history of humanity, right? You're mm. living better than every other person except for a handful of billionaires on the planet. You are living better than any person in the history of civilization. And you're going, but I should have a little bit more. Right. right? <laughs> Not even I want, I should. It's that yeah. entitlement. That's where I think it's super irritating. Because you could say, yeah. like a lot of people will say, like, well, I want more. Oh, it would be nice to be able to do this. I would like that. But I don't need it. And I am i don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. Right? Like yeah. some people legitimately do deserve it. And like right. when they go out and they actually, you know, really build something and they, they work at it. And it's like, sure, you, you are owed that money. But in her case, she's not owed it. It is exactly what entitlement is. Yeah, she doesn't you even want something work as far as we know. Right. <laughs> that it's, she's, yeah, oof. oof. <laughs> so it's so great it's... to have these characters early on in the show. And because they're also serving in a, in a functional way where the, the way 
Saul, or I, I keep saying Saul, but the way Jimmy, what he learns from them, how he is, uh, he says this, I think to, to Kim, that um, he's surprised because he expected criminals to be smart. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he just, this seems to be what ultimately pushes him into becoming more of a criminal lawyer, as Jesse Pinkman from Breaking Bad puts it, right? It's like, you don't want a criminal lawyer, you want a criminal lawyer ah, <laughs> that <right. laughs> that Jimmy is, we, and I, I don't think that gives anything away. We know yeah. where it's kind of going, even if you haven't watched Breaking Bad, you've got a sense of seeing, even from season one, what he struggles with, right? Yeah. That. Yeah, and, and I mean, even, uh, you know, when Betsy is first, uh, you know, talking to, to Jimmy yes. and then she's like, you know, you just seem like the kind of lawyer that a guilty person yes. uh, would hire. Exactly. Uh, maybe she doesn't even say it to Jimmy, but I think she might no, say No, she it to... does. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, I, I understand that point of view. But you are guilty, and <laughs> right, right. Um, this thing is, but you are guilty. You're just so entitled and privileged that you can't even, like, as as he puts it, you know, like her and logic are on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're totally separate. They are living in completely different places. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, oh man, she she is honestly on another planet. Um, yeah. There's... That's what I'm talking about with the comedy. Like that yeah. line <laughs> is so well written and it's so funny, but it's yeah. not slapstick. It's it's right. not a pun. It's just it is because you've created such great characters that that insight into her, that little jab is yeah. so spot on that it's impossible <laughs> not to laugh. <laughs> yeah. You would have to return the one point six million dollars. What one point six million dollars? There's no money. <laughs> it's like right. <laughs> but this is like I say, they they are serving this this functional role because you have incompetent criminals in season mm -hmm. one. So you've got, for instance, you've got Price, who is he's bumbling completely uh, the antithesis of intimidating. Right? He's a complete pushover, and you go. That's a drug dealer, <laughs> right? Price is a drug dealer, and technically, right, he actually is. He is a criminal drug dealer. And you go, you know, like I, I've seen people talk about this before. They're like, you know, when you're a kid and you hear drug dealer, then you think like this monstrous, super scary person. And then when you grow up, then you're like, it's that idiot, the one who <laughs> failed math class who sat sat next to me. You know what I mean? Right. Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> just like yeah it's like the one who like smoked pot all the time and then dropped out and it's like you know doesn't wash his clothes often enough you're like that dude and you're like oh, okay that's a drug dealer right and it's like and it's not entirely true on the show but you do have some of that mm -hmm. right so you've got price who's not a skilled criminal right and then you have the kettlemans who are not skilled criminals yeah. but the real big bad criminals the cartel members are underneath the surface so yeah. you don't see that at all and then mike who's actually quite a criminal he is just like out there in plain sight with his regular day job and you wouldn't assume that he's a criminal and he's a retired police officer and he knows enough about the law and enough about the justice system to know how to avoid getting in trouble yeah right that you go Ooh, so that's an incredibly skilled criminal. There's other incredibly skilled criminals. But Jimmy, I think, underestimates how skilled the top criminals are. And so this is ultimately what ends up leading him down this path of, I can be involved in this. I can take a step over here, right? It's not going to be a slippery slope. I can get involved in this because if the Kettlemans, you know, did what they did, then... Like, I'm smarter than them. I right. <laughs> craftier than they are. Uh, yeah. That that seems to open up mentally for him the possibility of going down this pathway. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. No, that's that's a great way of putting that. Um, all right. Uh, are you good on the Kettleman's then? Yeah. <laughs> let's maybe talk... Um, Marco, and then we'll talk Kim, and then we'll get into Jimmy and, and uh, Chuck. Okay, sounds uh, good. So, 
Marco, of course, is his best friend from Cicero, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know what to, to say about him, but obviously, you know, the, the, the most significant thing is the fact that you can see that if Jimmy did not, if, if Chuck didn't bail Jimmy out when Jimmy was in trouble for the Chicago sunroof thing, right. then, and if Jimmy didn't go to Albuquerque, he and Marco would just continue scamming people like, you know, again and again and again until probably they get either, you know, incredibly um, like, I don't know, violently assaulted mm. or arrested. Right. But <laughs> short of that, they'd just be hanging out in the same bar, yeah. doing the same stupid con jobs, making a little bit of money here and there and um, just going nowhere that yeah. even though probably something like 10 years have passed between from when, you know, Chuck picked him up until he goes back then because not much has really changed for Marco mm -hmm. and so much has changed for Jimmy. Yeah. And to be able to see that, that then when Jimmy goes back and he goes back for uh, something like a week because he's been kicked out of his own case class action lawsuit against Sam Piper Crossing because mm -hmm. HHM doesn't want him but really it's because Chuck doesn't want him yeah right so he goes back to that because it's like well if Chuck doesn't want me then I'll go back to this old life that I had and then realizing I'm not that person anymore right, right. that I can do this but it's just not who I am he doesn't even tell Marco until the last day that he's there that um, or I guess not the last day that he's there, but the, the essentially the day that Marco dies, that he even tells him that he's a lawyer. Right. Yeah. It's just that didn't come up in a week. <laughs> yeah. Spending all day, every day with Marco, like it, that, because, uh, you know, he's like, yeah, I've got clients and all this. And then explains that he's a lawyer. But Marco represents the, he represents Slip and Jimmy. Yes. Right. Yeah. But Slip and Jimmy is gone and he can't come back. Because even when, Jimmy tries to do that con job on uh, Betsy Kettleman with the skateboarding twins. Right. That even when he tries to do that and he talks about Slip and Jimmy, he explains it to them. He's ultimately not Slip and Jimmy anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. He's just not. So the stuff that he starts doing, like his con with the billboard, for instance. Yeah. Right. With like having the, <laughs> the work fall off of the platform and then he goes up and rescues him and it all gets filmed to get publicity. Right. That's just an elaborate con job. That's it is Slip and Jimmy, but not really. Mm -hmm. It's something else entirely. Yeah. Well, actually, OK, that that's interesting because um, I I was I could see either reading for the billboard incident where either it it was all planned or that just the part of the plan was, you know, designing that billboard that way. And the guy falling was actually uh, a spontaneous thing that he didn't plan. He did plan it. It's, it's in the show. Um, he gets up there and then they shake hands and the guy says, what took you so long? Yeah. But I didn't think that that was like, because that doesn't necessarily mean that they had planned for him to come up and rescue him. It could I'm just sure. mean like, you know, he's like, you know, like, thanks so much. Like, man, what took you so long? You know, ha, ha, ha. Like, that sort of thing. Because there, like, that would definitely also happen. <laughs> I, you cannot convince me of that. Okay. Dude, I, I think that that's possible. But <laughs> there's, watch it again. There's no way. There's no way that that's uh, how that scene is meant to be interpreted. I'm telling you, if you watch that scene again, then you're going to see that that the, the they obviously have had this agreement of how things will function. That this has been his plan all along to get him to fall off. Yeah, I don't know. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll watch it again, but yeah, I've seen it twice now, and both times, and I went, eh, I could see it being read either way. It so. can, it's a bad reading. It's a it's a incorrect reading. I'm telling you, I'm telling you that it is. I don't normally do, but I'm telling you that that is, there's only one reading for that as far as like what the filmmakers wanted you to to think that it was orchestrated. That that, but I still don't think that that's a slip and Jimmy con job. Right. And what I mean by that is, the the slip and Jimmy con job is something 
that is it's not a long con and slip and jimmy is a short-term con artist right because there's the the short con and the long con right mm -hmm. that there's yeah. there's different types of of being a, a a con artist and he i guess my point here is that he is taking on this new persona as he moves more and more into becoming Saul Goodman where that persona is the long con that Saul Goodman he's Saul Goodman all the time right he's only slipping Jimmy when he wants to you know like get like 20 bucks from somebody at the bar or right. when he wants to do like a more elaborate con of you know the passed out businessman in the alleyway with the Rolex and the wallet full of cash and all of that. Those are short-term cons. What we start seeing Jimmy do, even in season one, are elaborate long cons that are taking place over days and weeks. And these yeah. are complex um, cons that he's putting on that the the old slip and Jimmy would not have the patience to see through that, you know, Marco really respects Jimmy. He respects that. Like he says, you know, how much he loves watching him work, but it's obvious that Marco has got no ambition. And when he, and when Jimmy was slipping Jimmy and Cicero, he essentially had no ambition either. Mm -hmm. And now he's got ambition. He doesn't right. want to make 20 bucks or 50 bucks or, you know, 500 or $600. He is willing to take like 20 grand from the Kettleman's to be able to buy billboards, you know, spend tons of money on a suit, changing his hair, photoshopping his hair to look as much like Howard as he possibly can yeah. to get in trouble with, you know, copyright infringement and all of that stuff at Howard's exit to infuriate Howard to the point where he then you know, does this whole, I'm going to, you know, go to the press and he can't, he, initially he can't get the press. So that's mm. where he then comes up with the next plan, which is, it wasn't just to film himself. How was he going to show like the film to anybody? He's getting these kids from the college to film him. Mm. Right. Yeah. How, where was he going to show that? That uh, well, I would assume that he would uh, like send it to the media. Do you think that, he believes if the, he's contacted journalists, they all say no. That they're then going to say yes because he sends them a videotape. Uh, uh, I mean, <coughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I guess it's it, it's a little it, it's a little confusing to me how he would get this um, you know billboard company worker to go along with his plan because that had to be like an official billboard worker <laughs> maybe maybe not um whether he is or isn't but he, like, even if he is it's not that hard to say i'll give you a thousand dollars to fall off you're harnessed i'll pull you up and you can see even with the harness he doesn't pull him up that's the other thing that's what i'm saying that you're wrong in the way you interpret it he does not pull him up there is if you look the harness itself starts retracting and the harness pulls him up mm. jimmy makes it look like he's pulling Watch the harness. The harness pulls him up. He doesn't have the strength to do it because Jimmy knows that if this guy pulls too hard, he's going to fly off. Right. Yeah. I'm telling you that if you watch the scene again, you're going to see the harness retracts, that Jimmy does something with it where it starts pulling the worker back up, but he makes it look good on this side. But on this side, it's retracting, that it was all orchestrated, and that the worker knows he's not in danger of... of um, dying but he's not happy hanging out there for you know however long it ended up being but right. it's just that he paid him he paid him money and the only reason why we don't see it portrayed on screen is because the showrunners want us to be unsure of what's happening until they shake hands and then you know you have that little exchange mm -hmm. but there nobody would have taken that tape the only re he was that thing was a ruse for him to be filming it. So that way, knowing, oh, it's enough of an excuse that I can say I was filming it because I wanted 
you know, some media attention for the fact that they try to remove my billboard, but that way he can use that footage and sell it to, or, or just give it to different media outlets in Albuquerque mm-hmm. that. Yeah, no, like I, 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 I'm not saying that 100% like definitely wasn't set up. I just feel like there's enough there that I could see a reading of that where it wasn't, uh, orchestrated does that make sense then with him becoming more and more of a criminal lawyer and a con artist and becoming this more sophisticated version of slip and jimmy as he steps into this role of saul goodman does it make sense that he just bumbled his way into this Uh, i mean i don't know I, i i think that there's because it's he still doesn't want to like show Chuck, but only because like, you know, the uh, the article in the newspaper is, you know, showing the the billboard and everything and that, you know, he doesn't want uh, Chuck to know about uh, the billboard and all that. Um, I think that he's genuinely surprised by getting messages at the end of that episode. He's happy he's relieved because it worked because his con actually worked he's never done a con like this before Mm. and he's becoming a new kind of con artist this is better call saul this is how he becomes saul goodman that the intention this is why i'm saying i have too much respect for the writing of vince gilligan to think that this was just a coincidence and he bumbled his way into it that doesn't make any sense of I, i don't see how that interpretation can be supported based off of everything else that we know about the show Mm. Um, because he doesn't want chuck to know he doesn't want chuck to see the newspaper because he believes that chuck's condition is aggravated by his slip and jimmy persona Mm. so that's why he doesn't want chuck to see the newspaper and also jimmy at least at that point in the 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 show believes that Howard is the one who has a problem with him, not right. Chuck. And he's trying to hurt Howard. He's not trying to hurt Chuck. That he thinks mm-hmm. that Chuck is on his side. That yeah. he wouldn't have cared afterwards um, once he finds out that Chuck doesn't want him to be at the law firm and um, all of these things. Right. But to me, it it was, it's a new kind of con that he orchestrates and He's not sure if it will work or not, but he's becoming something other than Slip and Jimmy in that case. And like, because we're like, this is all like still, you know, somewhat focused on Marco, that this is the kind of thing that Marco would not really, I mean, I guess Marco could maybe be involved in it to some degree. Maybe he could be the guy up there on the, you know, uh, like billboard platform, but it's a totally different type of con artist that he's becoming. He's becoming the long con artist Mm. and and taking on this persona that he just walks in all the time he's Saul Goodman all the time Mm -hmm. and before he's only slipping Jimmy when he wants to be able to make a a quick 20 or 50 bucks or something right yeah Um, do you have anything else to add with Marco uh man it is um uh, it's shocking to see, you know, Marco die, uh, in that episode. Mm. Um, and to just be like, man, you know, like it's because like Marco had, he did get uh, a real job and, you know, all of that, yeah. but he still wasn't happy with it. And it's still like, it didn't fulfill him in any way. Um, and then, you know, and then he just ends up dying in an alley um dressed he's happy yeah 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 no for sure um but you know he's yeah i don't know it's um yeah and then the fact that that's you know that that it was this one last con right that marco was so uh obsessed with uh with getting jimmy to go along with and that jimmy didn't want to do it um and you know there's a sense of like well you know like how is that how does that affect uh you know jimmy knowing that it was his 
choice to go along with the con. Sure. In order to, you know, which, like, if uh, Marco had had the heart attack somewhere else, then he probably would have gotten help quicker. Um, yeah. Or something. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, he certainly has got to live with this guilt that it's essentially his fault that Marco dies. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, you know, he's already living with the guilt that he's disappointed Chuck. And so on the like, while the death of Marco kind of ends up, I guess... Okay, I think the only way I could really answer this is I, I have to. I, I, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna jump ahead into like some Breaking Bad stuff. So you're just gonna have to mute. Like, okay, <laughs> I'll I'll give you a thumbs up when I'm ready. Okay, so basically, in order for us to get to the point where Jimmy McGill becomes Saul Goodman, we have to see slowly all of these different um, characters who are incredibly important to him die off or tragically leave his life because he can't help himself. Marco is a great example of this. Obviously, Chuck and the disappointment with Jimmy is a great example of this. And then Kim, I'm sure we are leading to this as well. We have we've not gotten there in the series, but if you've watched Breaking Bad, you know that Kim is not involved in the show at all. She never makes an appearance. I can only think that she ends up tragically dying or I don't see it any other way. I think that his behavior is going to ultimately lead to her dying. So Marco dying, Chuck dying, Kim dying, I think is the last thing where he has nothing left to live for. So why not become Saul Goodman entirely? All right. I think that's, that's good. Um, Okay. (laughs) So I, I feel like that that's hopefully a, a, for people who were listening to that part of it, it's a good way of explaining it, but this is not, I'll just reiterate one of my points with the death of Marco. It's essentially that he has not much reason to be good anymore. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Even though Marco and him were doing the whole slip and Jimmy con artist thing. And Marco respects so much about him, like the artistry of him being a con artist yeah, he just loves that about Jimmy. But it, it's that that's a really important person because who does Jimmy have in his life? He's only got a few people in his life who are important to him. Mm-hmm. We find out Marco is incredibly important to him. Yeah. We know that Kim is important to him and increasingly so as we get into later seasons. Mm-hmm. And we know that Chuck is incredibly important. So mm-hmm. by the end of season one, Marco ends up dying. OK, so that's one out of three people. He finds out that Chuck doesn't believe that he's a real lawyer, doesn't want him working at HHM, doesn't respect him, doesn't consider him a peer, thinks that he's always going to be slipping Jimmy, taking the easy route through life, you know, like University of American Samoa, like what a joke, that doesn't make you a lawyer, you're trying to find shortcuts and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And that that's two out of three who are gone from his life. And that he, while Marco doesn't necessarily want Jimmy to be a good law abiding person, but he's an important person in his life. And so losing him means why should I be good if who am I being good for? Right. Cause that's what I said with Mike, Mike, we know is being like, what does he have left in his life? The only thing that he really seems to have left is taking care of his uh, daughter-in-law and his granddaughter. Yeah. And I think if it weren't for them, I don't see him bothering. I think he would just drink himself to death in Philadelphia. Right. Yeah. And because he's got that last little thing to a couple people to be good for, then he will be good for them. And Jimmy wants to be good for Chuck. But then even no matter how hard he tries, it's never going to he's never going to have Chuck's respect the way he has Marco's respect. Right. Yeah, I finally got there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that is really interesting. Um, all right. Did you have anything else to say with Marco then? No, let's move on to Kim, if you don't mm-hmm. mind. Um, so we don't get much with Kim in season one. Uh, mm-hmm. 
it's I, I forgot how little we actually get with her because if you've watched later seasons, I don't think this is really spoiling anything. She just becomes more prominent yeah. as as we get on in the series. And she's such an she's in an interesting position because while she started with Jimmy in the mailroom, but she was going to law school, right? Was she not in the mailroom or was she just as uh working as I don't know, mm-hmm. uh, she might have been like a paralegal or, mm-hmm. or something. Um, right, but she was not an actual lawyer um, early on, like in the flash, in the flashbacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that anyway. So he has this good relationship with her, and they're kind of on the outside looking in and admiring uh, the partners in the law firm and the full fledged attorneys and all of that. And Jimmy, of course, because he, he respects his brother so much and Kim just respects the law and successful attorneys and all of that, that they've, because of the flashbacks, it's established how they became good friends and how they, they like each other and trust each other. And, you know, there's some romantic interest, but it doesn't really go anywhere. Right. Mm-hmm. Like when he gets into law school, then she kisses him in the flashback. Right. Um, or no, it's sorry. It wasn't law school. It's when he passes the bar exam. Then she yeah. Yeah. Him. yeah. Um, and but it doesn't really go anywhere beyond that. And they kind of flirt with each other, like when he calls her up and like this whole thing, like, yeah, you know, yeah. hey, I'm not talking dirty to you. And it's like, and you're not <laughs> talking dirty to me and that whole thing. And, you know, come over for a foot massage and <laughs> all of that, right? <laughs> that there's some yeah. flirting, but it doesn't actually go anywhere. And, but she's in this tough position because he desperately wants her to join his law firm. That, yeah. He is a paralegal, but now he's got some money because mm-hmm. of the Kettleman's. So can he somehow get Kim to come alongside him? And because, you know, since HHM doesn't want him, then he'll start up his own law firm. And, yep. you know, he knows that Kim is an incredibly talented, gifted lawyer. So why not have her work with him and she can be a partner, a named partner in his firm immediately, right? Mm-hmm. That it would yeah. be... Wexler McGill or McGill Wexler, whatever he proposes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, but she's stuck because it, she's put in all of her time. And as she puts it, you know, she literally owes HHM because they put her through law school and they paid for her to go to law school. So she actually owes yeah. them her student <laughs> loans. And, uh, yeah. but she also, it's, do you continue on in this traditional, very um you know corporate law firm approach or do you go a little bit more independent even though they're not uh, i don't i don't know whether they're incorporated or not but i'm saying it's very much a corporate culture at hhm you know do you go with somebody like jimmy right (laughs) yeah as much as she respects jimmy and cares for him she's torn and she genuinely is torn Mm -hmm. between the two positions yeah no for sure And, and Yeah, and then the fact that she has to rationalize with herself in order to say, like, you know, that she just can't. And that she is sorry that she can't. Right. Um, uh, You know, at least, again, in the the first season. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But, and that's what, like, that hurts Jimmy. There's all of these things that we get in season one that just hurt him. And, like, we just see him get, you know beat up in various ways emotionally yeah you know the the death of marco uh you know with chuck and what is ultimately this huge betrayal and kim doesn't want to come alongside him and you know the the kettlemans won't sign with him um you know what i mean it's just it's like it's one thing after another one humiliation after another one betrayal after another one disappointment after another and you look at this and i mean there's so much of of watching better call saul where i don't know about other people but it just feels like when you watch it you're like how is this man still standing yeah you know yeah no absolutely the world is against him every single aspect of the world and and yet he's still you know he's still trying yeah (laughs) it's and in a weird way like i think like it's one of the things i absolutely love about the show and i find it inspiring and motivating right Mm -hmm. that it's 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 a great feeling to look at it and to say 
you know, even though it's, it's of course a fictional character, but to look at this and, and say like he just keeps striving even when he's had disappointment after disappointment and it's like and it's true he can still be successful even though this happened and that happened and that happened that doesn't mean that he won't ultimately be successful yeah and yeah. that despite the fact that he ha would have every justification imaginable to play the victim and then to just say well forget it like i i won't be a, a lawyer anymore uh, he he doesn't give up on his ambitions and it's just he has to keep reinventing himself and ultimately going the traditional way the establishment way he rejects this because the establishment won't have him right yeah yeah and, and i think that's a pretty good transition to talking about uh jimmy and chuck then yeah so and... we, we mentioned a lot already with it. yeah so you go for it go for it yeah i mean i i just love the relationship between the two of them where you know they are brothers they have walked different paths um but jimmy being the younger brother has always admired chuck uh you know for all these different things and always thought well i'll never be as good as chuck Right. So that's what leads him down, you know, the 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 bad path that he went on. And then when he gets his second chance and he's like, OK, if I really, really buckle down, maybe, maybe I can actually get to, uh, you know, uh, not to Chuck's level, but at least be uh, respected by yeah. Chuck. And yeah. th that's all that he's looking for, really. And it's um, it's gut wrenching to see him you know struggle through this and just everything that he does then check then chuck finds flaw flaws yes with it. it's yes. just yeah and he's all like chuck does not believe in jimmy at all and we no. as the audience see that but jimmy can't right you know despite right. all the evidence and he just he, he doesn't see it for the longest time um you know until again like toward the end of this season where Chuck tells him, you know, like, you're not a real lawyer mm -hmm. and all that. And it's just like, oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I um, thought about starting the podcast with that. Just me sh screaming. At, you're not a real podcaster. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's such right. a great line from yeah. the show. Like, it's I don't know how it's so simple, but it cuts so deep after all of that for mm -hmm. Chuck to just be so blunt like it just shows that you can tear somebody apart without cursing right. to just say yeah. you're not a real lawyer is i think yeah. the most hurtful thing chuck possibly could have said to jimmy yeah absolutely more so than saying you're still slipping jimmy more so right. than like literally anything then anything it's just else. you're not a real lawyer it, because it's how else can jimmy legitimize himself in chuck's eyes he's yeah. done everything to legitimize himself yeah exactly because that's the thing it's that chuck isn't just saying at the moment you're not a lawyer it's right you know you'll never be a lawyer that's not right. a real lawyer you're that's not right. one and yeah. that cannot change because of just who you are mm -hmm. Oof. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> it's, even... it's brutal like you just look yeah. at that and you're like how how do you come back from that? And there's so much of this of Better Call Saul justifies Saul Goodman as a persona. Like mm -hmm. it just, it gets to this point where you, you just realize of where this is going because like I say, it's called Better Call Saul, right? right. It's not James McGill. It's not whatever else you, you could think of to, to name this show. Um, it's, it's obviously leading to to something and it is the ultimate transformation where he just becomes Saul Goodman all the time yeah. because what else what other choice does he have essentially all of his other opportunities are just being removed from him slowly um, and slowly as we go through the series it just becomes a funneling effect right that right. It, it's just it's all leading him into becoming this you know, criminal lawyer persona who's just this, you know, like you see it in, it's it's really well done. I didn't 
I don't know how much I caught it the first time I watched it. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. But when he is trying to get match his suit to Howard's, where he mm. wants to get the exact suit, and I love that scene where he goes into the uh, the tailor, and then he's got his like list of all these things. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I need like, a knit tie. <laughs> like yeah. I, I didn't even know how you described like what type of tie that was that Howard is always wearing because the ties look so different, right? Because it's not okay. silk. It's not yeah. whatever else. And it's like, oh, it's knit. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. it just, yeah. It's like, how douchey. <laughs> I mean, it it kind of looks cool, to be honest. But like, there's just a certain amount of like, you know, how much do you need to rub it in people's faces that you are this high price lawyer? That you mm -hmm. like a silk tie. You're too good for a silk tie you have to wear right. this knit tie right and i was like it's not that it doesn't look good or, or cool in some ways it's just like wow you're really setting yourself apart from people yeah. um and as far as costume design like that's so well done on the show um mm. getting him to to have that so anyway jimmy goes and he is looking he, he wants to imitate that exactly for the billboard to be able to essentially plagiarize them as much as mm -hmm. he can but then the tailor goes back to try to find some of the fabric and um, then he's looking and he's looking at these garish colors of <laughs> yeah. his shirts. And we know that's ultimately how his sartorial style, like his sartorial choices that he's going to make. And he's going to start wearing really garish suits with like orange, you know, yeah. dress shirts and like purple and like green ties and whatever else. Like he's going to be, you know, this buffoonish like look at me type of lawyer um, right. but he's not there yet but you can see that he's kind of tempted like it's just there's in the back of his head it's like ooh, i'd be good at that but i'll try to be howard i'll try to be chuck i'll try yeah. to be something that doesn't come easily to me because if i can just essentially that would be faking it. Him being James McGill, Esquire, would be him putting on a persona. Right. I think just as much as putting on the persona of Saul Goodman is putting on a persona. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. It's, um, uh, man, yeah, the, the costume design in, in this show is incredible. I mean, like, the way that um, all of Jimmy's suits, at least at the beginning, his one suit, I guess, um, then it's it's clearly the wrong size for him. You yeah. know, it's just it's ill fitting, and he's he doesn't fill out the clothing right. right. But he's yeah, he's absolutely. not there yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's not fully fleshed out. Um, even and and just while we're on this, just with some of the costume design, but with like set design, the fact that he drives like that awful Suzuki Esteem, <laughs> the yellow like. thing, like, and like I wonder if you what you think of this but do you think there's something to the fact that it's not just like this crappy old suzuki that he's driving but the fact that it's an esteem because we they keep it on there they keep the badge on there where it says esteem and it's just the fact that it's like it's not it's not high self-esteem it's not low self-esteem it's just like esteem how do you esteem this person how do you value <laughs> them how do you judge them right because to esteem right. somebody means to determine their worth and the fact that it's like essentially he's driving around saying, give me worth, give me worth, because right. he wants people to give him worth like Chuck, like yeah. value me as a real lawyer, esteem me like that. But then he drives this piece of crap. So it's like, <laughs> how are people going to judge him? They're going to judge him as this like loser. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, but he's constantly asking every time he's driving around, every time he's in public, he's saying, please esteem me. Please tell me what I'm worth. Please tell me what I'm worth. Right. right. Yeah. 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 And, and of course, you know, he also is um, always separating himself from that. Oh, sorry. My, you know, yes. my actual car is in the shop and all that. But but yeah, no, it is. Uh, yeah, that's that's a really good point. There's definitely like I that's think there's definitely intentional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, they could have removed that because they removed the Suzuki. They mm. You don't have that on right. there, but it still says esteem. Right. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's. 
it's interesting. And man, he's a, just a little side note. He's able, like, they must have done something to the car's in great mechanical shape because he drives the hell out of that car on the show. <laughs> and you're just like, if the actual like suspension is in the kind of shape that the rest of the car looks like it's in, then there's like, and the tires and the brakes, there's no way. Cause he's always like speeding around and swerving around right. corners. And you're like, how are you not throwing like a tie rod end or something like this? <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I mean, he has trouble starting it the one time. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's... Uh, oh, man. All right. So getting back to uh, Jimmy and Chuck, um, or more specifically, just Chuck. Yeah. Um, I, I. It's such a fascinating character to have this person who is, um, you know in layman's terms, uh, allergic to electricity. Yeah. Um, then I think, because that, that is a genuine thing that some people suffer from. Um, and it, not to that extreme as far as I understand it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, to, to think that, you know, like that it's all psychosomatic, that it's all just, you know, in his head and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But that Jimmy, he's not, He's not, uh, he's not so much enabling it as he's just being like, there's nothing else that we can do. We can't convince him that it's not real. And so you can right. either help him live or just watch him suffer in pain from his own, you know, uh, psych um, psychologically inflicted symptoms. Yes. And like specifically in the hospital, I, is, is yeah. what I'm thinking of. No, absolutely. No, you're right. You're right. I think it's just I'm, I'm thinking through it. And I do. I absolutely love that. I don't know how Gilligan or whoever else on the writing staff came up with this idea that Chuck mm -hmm. would have this condition. It is so interesting because even though it, it puts them in this interesting position, because ultimately Chuck should be grateful for the fact that Jimmy is yeah. doing everything for him and it doesn't change his opinion about Jimmy. Yeah. You're like, even after and, all of that daily for yeah. like a year and a half. And um, even when uh, Howard sees the list of all the different things that, yeah. that Jimmy does and he's like, you do all of this every day. Like he's mm -hmm. impressed, but Chuck still is not like there's, <laughs> yeah, there's no sense of absolutely gratitude or, or anything. It's, yeah. And to, I guess I just, since you mentioned it, then I feel like we might as well address it. I just wanted to say that Howard is a misunderstood character for much of the, the season. And even as seasons go on, he's often set up. I feel like he's a straw man, right? That mm, yeah, Jimmy's yeah. constantly trying to launch attacks against Howard, thinking that he is his enemy. And it's like, Howard is not your enemy. You keep yeah. trying to hurt Howard, but Howard is not your enemy. Um, yeah. That, because Howard is impressed by Jimmy in like yeah. every way. Yeah. And, you know, like calling him like Charlie Hustle. And he's so impressed that, you know, he went to law school by correspondence and all of these things that, that Howard's got, he esteems Jimmy highly and mm -hmm. Chuck doesn't. A yeah. And that Chuck is such a piece of crap that he puts it on Howard. He convinces Jimmy intentionally at times that it's Howard. And then he, forces Howard to say things that Howard doesn't mean in yeah. order to to deflect the anger that Jimmy would have at himself, at Chuck, to deflect yeah. it over to Howard. Like, that's what I'm saying, that you look at this and you go, even though, like, Chuck is certainly not the moral center of the show. Right. That <laughs> even though he's law-abiding and he's got this admirable skill as a scholar of the law, he's pretty awful to Jimmy. And you could say he's got good reason for not believing in him, but mm. no matter what Jimmy does, it's not enough. And uh, anyway, so yeah, the condition that he has is interesting, but I don't know that we ever get an answer because we certainly don't get it in season one. And it's been a while since I've seen seasons two and three. If we get an answer about why the condition started in the first place. Yeah. I, I don't think that uh, we do get an explanation, but I think, if if I had to hazard a guess, I would say that it's uh, shortly after uh, Jimmy 
uh, you know, shows Chuck that he passed the bar. I think so too. Yeah. I think that's got to be that what was it the is. inciting incident, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure. Like, I I don't see how else you can read it because it's obvious that it is triggered by Slip and Jimmy, right? Mm-hmm. And as Chuck says, I think it's in the last episode that he says to to Jimmy that you know. Slip and Jimmy with a law degree is like a, a monkey with a machine gun or something like that. I forget the I forget the exact line, but it's something along those lines of that's why he's so horrified to the point where it's like he literally can't go out into the world anymore. He can't be connected in any way. He's disconnected. He has disconnected the electricity from his house, the actual like lines that come into his house, everything that comes into his house. He has disconnected himself as much as possible while still living in a city because it's like he can't be part of a civilization in which Jimmy can have a law degree. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that's messed up. That Absolutely. He is that concerned with his brother and i guess my attitude would be to to chuck i i i have far more of like a mike attitude than probably anybody else on the show of just like you know like you think he's the first criminal lawyer like you know what i mean (laughs) i'm just like how is he that dangerous you think every lawyer except for jimmy perfectly follows the law and right. doesn't do things that are dubious in nature. And like, like, I mean, like, haven't you ever heard a lawyer joke ever? <laughs> like, right. do you know what I mean? Like, why is it that Jimmy scares you so much with him having a law degree? There's plenty of lawyers who I'm sure, you know, are, are far, have got ethics that are far more dubious than anything that's, you know, a slip in Jimmy character might have. Right. Yeah, and it's definitely because of the, you know, family connection. Yeah. That, you know, um, it, it, it that's the really fascinating thing is that Jimmy sees them as like, well, we're brothers. Of course, right. we have to look out for each other. We have right. to love each other and all that. And Chuck sees it as, well, we're brothers. And yet look what happened to you. And, you know, and, and all of this, like, he's just like, you're not as good as me. You never will be. And Mm -hmm. that it's just, you know, you can't take shortcuts. I worked so hard and you're just, you know, yeah, doing all these uh, dubious things in order to get by, in order to try to reach my level. And it's, it's, yeah, it's this irritation with the imitation that, uh, (laughs) you know, that Chuck is like, you're, you only became a lawyer because I'm a lawyer. Yeah. And I think and, that's part of it is that Chuck is kind of mad at himself. And that's why he's punishing himself in this way. Right. Mm, yeah. Because yeah. it's psychosomatically, he is punishing his own body for the fact that his brother now has a law degree. And he's like, if it wasn't for the fact that I'm a lawyer and such a skilled lawyer, he never would have become a lawyer. And so this is partially my responsibility. And how the hell can I get him to get off of this path? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. he just seems helpless in getting him off of the the, the path of being a lawyer. And um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I, I don't I, I don't know what else like where else to go with it other than it, it's just it's a incredibly um, destructive dynamic that they have between the two of them. Mm-hmm. And it is I don't even know how much of it you can blame on Jimmy. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. It it is. um, I don't know. I mean, I, I throw so much of the blame on Chuck for everything. Cause it's just Chuck. He, Chuck is so prideful. Yes. You know, he just refuses to admit that Jimmy could be better than him at literally anything. Right. You know, it's like, you know, even focusing on elder law. And he's right. like, well, anybody could do that. And it's like, yeah, but you would probably struggle with it because you don't know how to interact with, you know, the elderly and all of this. And yeah, it's just. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Because Chuck is just nothing but, you know, puffed up. He is so full of pride. Yeah. Uh, that That is exactly it. That he can't handle the idea that Jimmy might actually be good at some stuff and better than him in, in certain ways. And it, it is in, um, I, I can't remember, is it in this season where they go to the karaoke bar um, after Jimmy gets his 
law degree, like when he passes the bar. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't, I don't remember uh, that. Okay, because I just watched season four, so I'm going. Wait, maybe I'm getting mixed up. That, that's the problem. I watched season four, then we rewatched season one. So <laughs> anyway, it, it, it um, I guess, it, whatever. It's, it's, it's not anything. It's just they, they ultimately they go to a karaoke bar, and you know, Jimmy's like trying to encourage Chuck to sing, and mm. Jimmy's terrible at singing karaoke, <laughs> and then ultimately Chuck goes up. And like is so reluctant. No, 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 I couldn't. I couldn't possibly. I couldn't possibly. And then he's incredibly good. He's an amazing <laughs> singer. And then Jimmy just kind of like wanders off and it's supposed to be a duet. And then it just turns into a solo for Chuck. And I'm just like, that's perfect. That's exactly them. It's like Jimmy's right. like, even that in a social setting that he still shows <laughs> me up when I was trying to like pull him out of his shell. He's good at that too. That yeah. that's kind of the dynamic they've had their entire life. But Chuck just can't give Jimmy credit for anything and the the way it is hurting his own body that the the way it shows up in the show I don't know how you come up with that idea yeah honestly it is it's so brilliant and it's so out there <laughs> yeah yeah um, yeah all right we we should uh wrap this up uh soon but um uh yeah, I, I, I guess just, uh, do, do, I guess, do you have any final thoughts? Um, not especially. Um, I, I feel like anything that I have, I, like, I, I'll just, I just want to save until we move on to season two. Agreed. Yeah. Um, and, uh, one thing that I wanted to say is, uh, you know, as much as I said at the beginning that I definitely relate with Jimmy that is in terms of like, you know, I've always looked at you like, especially because, you know, our dad wasn't around when when, uh, when we were growing up, specifically when I was growing up. Um, and so, you know, always looking at, at you as like, you know, this father figure and, you know, somebody to admire and to be like, wow, he's such a great writer. I, you know, want to be uh, a writer like him and, you know, all these different things that um, uh, that are, you know, from you. But I don't have that resentment or anything that right, Jimmy has. I was going to say, are you calling I me Chuck? Feel, no, I don't feel I tell like you that you're good are, at stuff all the time. You do. <laughs> yeah, I know. So that's why I wanted to clarify <laughs> that that's, that part of it is not that it's, it's right. I, I see the Jimmy perspective, but I'm not getting the Chuck in response. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, I get that. and But that's what I was saying at the beginning of the podcast is I think, and that's what makes this show so great is the fact that, um, I think so many people identify with Jimmy as being this underdog who has got so much adversity and continues. We admire the fact that he's got moxie, right? That he's got mm. persistence, that he, and he's creative in his problem solving and that he continues to go after it, even though he gets discouraged that it's like, if you think you've had a bad day or a bad week, you know, watch better call Saul and be like, right. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It, it not only could be worse, it could be worse and it is possible to respond better than I'm responding right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Instead of getting just totally dejected and giving up that you could still have this attitude of, I'm going to make this, uh, I'm going to make something good come out of this. And there is a way to make this work. Those are such admirable traits in Jimmy that um, I, I feel like a lot of people identify with that. Yeah, I, like I identify with that. I look at that and, and I'm just like, there's a lot of things that I've worked at and I've pushed against and it's just like, and I'm just not finding success and I'm not finding success. And it's frustrating when you see other people who are more successful, whether they have more talent or they've just had the right circumstances come their way or they haven't faced the same kind of adversity and you see them being successful. Like I've seen other people be successful and, you know, in places where I haven't been successful and it's easy to get discouraged and to, de to get dejected and to give up. But like I say, as much as it is this kind of tragic thing of him becoming more of a Saul Goodman type of character, it also just makes so much sense. You're just saying, who else could stick it out as long as he has to yeah. try to continue to do the right thing, even when it just feels like it's never going to work. But he just keeps trying with this optimism and hope and, and that I think regardless of like the, the sibling dynamic, right? That I'm saying, like, I look at Jimmy and I'm like, I identify with a, a lot of that. And I think so many yeah. people do. And a character like Chuck, I, I mean, Chuck is exactly what pride is, where he's taking pride, but it's such false pride. It's what did he do to deserve his brain, 
right? He's right. certainly done a lot to discipline himself to to be skilled enough in academics. But the thing is, is like it, he didn't he didn't do anything to be born with an incredibly high aptitude for you know um, reading and writing and studying the law, like. He didn't do anything to impact his aptitude. He yeah. was disciplined, just like somebody who's born with a low IQ hasn't done anything to deserve that either. Mm -hmm. But he thinks that makes him better than Jimmy. And Jimmy yeah. doesn't have the same aptitude for this. And he's still trying to, to be successful. And I think Chuck hates that. He hates the fact that somebody through <laughs> persistence and stick to can <laughs> actually kind of be his peer. And he's like, you're not my peer because he's right. so full of pride that he can't allow that to happen. And uh, it's yeah. it's a really brilliant dynamic that you have on the show. Um, mm -hmm. My my final thought with it is, well, I guess two, like number one, I hope like because I'm significantly older than you. I mean, significantly like eight years or something. I don't know. Seven years, eight years, eight years. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean being an older brother then i'm like well, i hope i'm never a, a chuck like character but at the same time if i am better than you at certain things it's like i'm way older <laughs> right <laughs> so yeah like and, and one of the uh you know kind of frustrations with watching better call saul is seeing that jimmy is better at some things than chuck but that he's not really recognizing or accepting right. that he's better right. at those things and that chuck isn't acknowledging that Jimmy is better at those things either. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and with you and me, then like we definitely have, you know, different uh, skills, different, yes. you know, levels of of individual skills. And so it's, you know, we work together in order to make things work better, which is exactly what Jimmy tries to do in the one right. episode, and then it just fails because Chuck is. Yeah, <laughs> too prideful. That's, that's exactly it, right? And they, yeah. they don't treat it as complementary skills, even though they are complementary skills. They mm -hmm. should work together if it weren't for Chuck, right? Yeah. That they yeah. could be like those skateboarding siblings that we see at the beginning of the season. Right. If they could just get over themselves, especially if Chuck could get over himself. I mean, like just a small little example with the podcast, then I mean, the, the technical side of it, the editing, you do it. The thumbnails, you do it. You know how to use Photoshop. I don't like right. <laughs> you're you're very skilled with that. You've done brilliant thumbnails and like you're really great with Photoshop and editing and all of that stuff. And I I'm not. And like but, so that you that's have. You know, uh, it, many times I feel like you uh, are able to get at the deeper meaning of things uh, much more efficiently uh, than I am. So right. it's, yeah, it's the way that we work off of each other. And <laughs> yeah, which is what <laughs> Chuck and Jimmy should be doing, because those are complementary yeah. skills. And yeah. <laughs> the thing is, but they, yeah, it's just, it's, it's because of Chuck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I felt like I had I had another point to make. But um, yeah, I mean, in any case, and we'll we'll move on to to season two, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how we'll do this. I would like to kind of stagger the podcast where we go Better Call Saul, and then a little bit of Breaking Bad, and then back to Better Call Saul. But that also depends on the availability of Steve. So right. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll see how that goes. But yeah, we'll, we'll keep going with this in um, with a, a season two discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I am looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, folks, please let us know what you think below. And thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Ignore the bell, people. We're going to keep going. I, we're still ignoring it. Don't worry. I, I, I don't know what that... I think that's the fire drill. All right. We're, we're going to go home. Yeah, all right. We're done. <laughs>